Uh, thank you for the organizers for inviting me. I'll be telling you a bit about the new tools we've been developing for proteins, sugars, and nucleic acids. So like Dan said, we are the developers of uh, PB Redo, and we do structural biology research. Uh, but we don't just focus on protein, we also focus on, uh, we also look at nucleic acids, ligands, sugars, and metals. So everything you can find in your uh, macromolecular complex. And our goal is to help people with their structural biology research by providing new tools to analyze structure models, or groups of them, uh, new programs and algorithms to make uh, better structure models. We also try to help people by providing updated structure models. So let's look at the PDB Redo setup in a bit more detail. It's a fully automated pipeline for X-ray structures that refines fields and validates your model. So what you do is you have your current model, your X-ray data, your sequence, and possibly also restraints for new ligands. And it goes through a number of steps like refinement, rebuilding, and lots of validation. And out comes a new model uh, that is hopefully better and a lot of descriptive information, new maps, validation scores, uh, and structural analysis. And this pipeline works with CSP4 software, uh, most importantly, RefMac and Qt, uh, but also many tools that we've written, like Backflip and Tortoise, you'll hear more about that later, and Loophole. Uh, PDB Redo comes in two flavors on pdbredo.eu. We have a web server that allows you to redo your own structures. And we also have a data bank of redone PDB entries. And essentially, uh, it has more than 99% of all the X-ray structures in the PDB. And it's a system with positive feedback. So new methods that we develop, we apply to the data bank. And we use the data bank where, by data mining to improve our method development. Of course, and this is true for all developers, user feedback actually helps both. Uh, we are very much encouraging it because it helps us develop better methods and improve our data bank as well. So let's look at some of these developments. First, something for protein structure analysis. And well, when you describe a structure, we typically use secondary structure as a sort of a structural summary. And we do that in a 1D sequence-like format, but we will definitely also do that in 3D. So all the molecular graphics programs, for instance, allow you to color by secondary structure. But not all these programs give you the same results. So here you have two examples of uh, exactly the same coordinates in two different molecular graphics programs. And you can see the program on the left actually shows you much more uh, beta sheet than the program on the right. What we, actually, what we really need is more consistency. And we could have had that because DSSP provides the de facto standard. It's an old program, but still a very good one, uh, developed by Gopsch and Sander in the 1980s. But at the time it came with a proprietary license, which was sometimes difficult to use, so there was a lot of clones of DSSP around. And it assigns secondary structure by hydrogen bond analysis. Of course, there's other ways to look at secondary structure. One is, for instance, to look at different torsion angles. And DSSP writes out its output as a fixed format DSSP file. And uh, those have been available in the uh, DSSP data bank for more than 35 years now. But it didn't directly annotate PDB files. And uh, because it's a fixed format thing, it's uh, not suitable for very large structure models like we now get from electron microscopy. DSSP detects eight types of secondary structure the helices, so the alpha helix, but also the underwound 310 helix and the uh, uh, overwound 310 helix and the underwound pi helix. Different extended structures like beta strands and also beta bridges, but that's essentially just a single residue beta strand and different types of turns and anything that it cannot assign is assigned to random coil. So that's sort of the junk category. Now the problem is that's actually another type of secondary structure that has always been missing in the SSP. And this is called the polyprotein helix. Some people nowadays call it uh, the kappa helix. And it's a bit of a misnomer because you don't actually need protein to form this PP2 helix. It is a left-handed helix with three residues per turn. 
but it doesn't have any defining hydrogen bonds, only a position in the Ramachandran plot with uh, very typical phi psi angles, as you can see here marked by the X. Uh, and this is in the beta sheet region. And actually other secondary structure elements also fall in this region. So it's easy to overlook and it has been overlooked by DSSP for a very long time. Nevertheless, it's biologically very important. It's uh, uh, implicated in lots of protein-protein interactions. And there was a paper this year describing how the spike protein from SARS-CoV-2 interacts with ACE2 through these polyproline helices. So uh, sticking everything together, that meant that DSSP really had to be renewed. And that's what we did. We did a full rewrite of DSSP and now version full four is released on uh, GitHub with a BSD license. So that means that it's now easy for you to integrate DSSP in whatever workflow you want. It has full MMSIF support uh, and it does direct annotation of model files, both in PDB and in MMSIF format. But I encourage you to use MMSIF because you get much richer annotation. But the more scientifically more important feature is that it now detects these helices, of course, with some tolerance for the torsion angles and also the requirement that any helix has at least three residues because that's a single helical turn. And with this new DSSP, we could analyze the entire PDP. Um, and we find that about 2% of all residues uniquely fit the criteria to be assigned as PP2 helix. And there's another 1% of residues that sort of fits the criteria as well, but also fits other criteria. So depending on how you count, either two or 3% of all the residues in the PDB are a part of PP2 helices. And so that makes it actually a significant group of secondary structure. While we had this data, we also looked at some of the resolution facts. We looked at the 20% highest resolution PDB, uh, residues in the PDB and the 20% 20 lowest, uh, 20 lowest resolution residues. And we found that uh, there's no effect on the random coil content at low resolution. And we also saw that at low resolution, that's you more likely to find more alpha helix and less beta strands. So this is just a find. I'm not drawing any conclusions on that. So moving on from protein, let's talk a bit about carbohydrates. And carbohydrates are scientifically very interesting, but they're also very challenging. And it does require integration of all types of knowledge to get a good grasp on what these carbohydrates do. Uh, making good carbohydrate structure models actually requires the integration of many different research teams. So we collaborate with people from the PDB, uh, developers of CUT, Privateer, RefMac, and also CCP4 Monopoly Library uh, together to improve our tools and a lot of progress is made. And I'll show you one example. We can now build back better carbohydrates. And this is done by a routine in PDB Redo that uses a program called Carbivore that we made together with CUT and with Privateer. And what it does, uh, one of the functions is to rebuild trees with poor geometry uh, or poor sugars. An example here on the top right you can see an N-glycan and not a single residue makes sense biologically. And also quite a lot of them have very distorted geometry. Now, Privateer figures this out, uh, and then we remove all the residues and we can build back a perfectly sensible N-glycan. Alternatively, you can extend existing trees. So here you see an example where the density is not that clear and it's filled with waters, uh, but because the structure of N glycans is to some extent pretty uh, predictable, even at poor density, we can build larger trees. We can also build trees from scratch because N glycans have a very typical sequence tag, which is called a, a sequel. And every time we find such a sequence in a structure, we just try to see whether we can build an N glycan tree. And of course, if it's supported by the experimental data, then we keep that tree. So combining these three uh, ways of looking at the things, we found that you can add more than 16,000 extra um, sugar residues to the PDB. Now, 2020 marked a big improvement in uh, carbohydrate uh, methods by uh, the WWPDB remediating all the PDB entries with carbohydrates. 
And that meant better standardization of residue and atom names. And this has some very nice side effects. That means that we can uh, generate better descriptions for refinement, particularly of glycosidic linkages. Everything becomes more standard, and that makes it easier to make better restraints. This is particularly useful for carbohydrate ligands because those have lots of different sugars that used to be poorly annotated. This was also a good opportunity to renew the geometric restraints in the CSP4 monomer library. And we added new targets, mined from small molecule structures. And the team behind Privateer is now implementing restraints uh, to improve uh, ring conformations. And we're testing these restraints uh, at the very moment. Uh, another thing is that N glycans are now described as branched polymers. So you can actually assign a sequence to them. And um, so this is a much better description of the primary structure of a glycan uh, that didn't need tools had to be updated to uh, correctly generate or use this data. But this makes making databases and uh, data mining of glycan structures much easier. So when all these things are finished, uh, they will be combined and we will use them in PDB redo as well. And um, then hopefully, um, later this year, we will replace all the carbohydrate structures in the data bank with all this new technology. Moving on from sugars to our main attraction, and that's nucleic acid structure. So if you browse through the PB, you might have noticed that nucleic acid structures are actually relatively rare. If you see the ratio between the two here on the plot on the right, that's a big difference. And that does mean that quite a lot of the software that we use is sort of designed protein first. Nevertheless, there's good support for nucleic acids, but that's, there's limited development. And we've been, uh, been guilty of that as well, because also in PDB Redo, we didn't have any nucleic acid specific functionality. We did have the option to generate restraints with libg, but we actually didn't have any sort of test to see whether or not these restraints worked very well. So this was an important question. How do we validate nucleic acid structures? Well, you can, can of course look at covalent geometry and this is what validation programs already do. So you find outliers uh, or overall deviations in bond lengths and bond angles. Uh, the problem is that different programs tend to have different targets and these target values are actually an ongoing debate in the uh, nucleic acid community, particularly for the riboses and the phosphates, because the, even the bond lengths and bond angles seem to be conformation specific. Now there's a task force trying to find consensus restraints for these things, and then the refinement of the validation and refinement programs will also give you much more useful output. If we go one level higher, when we look at conformation, so torsion angles and such, then the mole probity has some validation for that with these uh, mole probity suites. Problem is that it only works for RNA. Uh, DNATCO actually has confal scores and that works for DNA and RNA and that's very useful. So what it does, it looks at all the torsion angles and uh, distances at, in the dinucleotides. But that's, that's a linear thing. Uh, turns out that there's no validation for baseband geometry. Fortunately, there is a program called DSSR from X3DNA that does give you descriptive values on uh, base pad geometry, but it doesn't put it in any sort of context. So this is something that we wanted to explore. Uh, so one parameter you automatically think of in base pairs is, of course, the hydrogen bonding. And that's what we looked at first, the hydrogen bond length. Um, of course, we tried to data mine the PDB redo data bank, but before we did that, we made sure that we had the best possible data. So we updated the restraint files first with the targets from Gilski and all published last year or the year before last year. And these have slightly updated values for the base planes. And with these new restraints, we replaced all the PDB redo entries of two angstrom resolution of beta that had nucleic acids in them. So then we analyze these structures uh, with DSSR to get all the hydrogen bond lengths. And of course, to make sure that we have really proper data, we filtered by uh, the density fit. So we only used base pairs in which both residues had a real space correlation coefficient of 0.95. 
And again, this data is readily available in the PDB Redo data bank. The next step was to find the resolution cutoff in which we still had enough data to do some statistics on it, but on the other hand, have the highest resolution possible. And this turned out to be at 1.6 angstrom. And you can see on the right that that's still quite a lot of observations. That said, uh, we only had enough data to look at Watson Crick base pairs, so none of the other base pairs. Next question was, should we keep DNA and RNA and DNA RNA base pairs separate? And the answer is yes, they turn out to be uh, dissimilar, the means, uh, at least uh, at a p value of uh, 1%. So now we have targets for hydrogen bonds. Now the next question is, can we use these as restraints in refinement? And we've shown previously, at least for proteins, that homology-based hydrogen bond restraints actually work quite well. But to test this, you need more validation than just fit to the restraints because that's what you put in. And we also know that these sort of restraints don't do that much for R factors or clash cores. So we added the dinucleotide confound score from DNA-ETCO. But we also had a closer look at other parameters. And DSSR writes these simple base pair parameters that were very useful. So these describe the relative orientation of uh, base, players, uh, base planes with respect to each other. So you have the uh, translational things like shear around the x-axis or stretching around the y-axis. You also have rotational parameters like buckle, that's rotation around the x-axis, and a propeller twist which is around the y-axis. And we did this, uh, we used the same base pairs because we knew they were good. And now we have means and standard deviation where we can calculate whole structure RMSZ scores. Again, we get the different types of base pairs, different and you can see from the propeller twist and from uh, the buckle that this is really necessary. So now we had the means to validate things and we could do an experiment. So what we did is we refined 6,300 structures with Watson Crick base pairs. That's essentially all of them in the PDB. And uh, we used the uh, previous refinement settings like uh, uh, X-ray restraint weights, weights and B-factor models from PDB Redo. Um, and then we tested six different sort of restraint models. So in all in all, some 38,000 re uh, refinements. So as a reference, we used no restraints and the other option is using the restraints targets that we mined. And we use the same weight for these hydrogen bond restraints as we previously did for pro proteins because that seemed to work quite well. Uh, but we also tried some other combinations. So we use the restraints that were, are generated by libg. And this includes also torsion angle restraints and stacking restraints like you see here on the right. And these restraints keep the base planes more or less parallel. Uh, it does have hydrogen bond length restraints as well, but it detects different ones and it also uses different targets. We also tried a few combinations of things. So our mine targets uh, together with the torsion restraint from libg and also our mine targets with the stacking restraints from libg and a combination of all three of them. So let's have a look at the results. So we split the data up in bins of equal resolution. So every resolution bin has the same number of structure models in them. And the first thing you see is that these hydrogen bond restraints uh, take away the effect for resolution on restraints. So the restraints themselves work. If you don't uh, uh, apply these restraints in light blue, you can see that the RMSZ goes up drastically. If you apply them, the RMSZ stays normal. We also notice no large effect on R and R3 as was expected. And finally, we noticed that the clash score um, slightly disfavors stacking restraints. So here the brown ones and the yellow ones and the blue ones are slightly higher than the other ones. Uh, of course, when you apply distortion restraints, then your confile score improves because that's torsional validation. But that takes away uh, independent validation options so like adding Ramachandran restraints and you don't want that uh, because, uh, well, you'll hear that in the next talk. Um, we also cause, it also causes kernel volume uh, outliers, which is a bit weird and that's was suspicious. So we decided not to use these uh, torsional restraints. So the remaining question is, should we use stacking restraints together with our distance restraints or not? Oh, the, to answer that question, we looked at the uh, base pair parameters 
And the first thing we saw is that uh, these stacking restraints don't do that much for stretching or shearing. However, if you look at buckle and propeller twist, and notably buckle here in the bottom, you can see that the restraints that have these stacking restraints, so that's the, the brown one, the yellow one, and the dark blue one, all have much better RMSZ scores. So combining all the results, we uh, concluded that using the distance restraints and the stacking restraints is the best combination. So this is what we implemented in PDB Redo. So the new version now automatically generates these stack restraints. So the hydrogen bond restraints and the stacking restraints. Of course, not a very high resolution because we don't want to bias our data for any further analysis, but also because it's just not needed. And a pointer for people who want to data mine PDB Redo, we always keep track of the sort of restraints that we use. So this is all recorded in the metadata. So we now have the nucleic acid uh, validation on base pair geometry, so that's the RMSZ values. Uh, but that's for the whole structure. We're now also trying to find suitable Z-score cutoffs to mark individual outliers and see if that works for us. And we have the denucleotide geometry validation from DNATCO. So that uh, leaves us with one more experiment, and that's running PDB Redo over all the nucleic acid structures in the data bank. And this is still ongoing, but the preliminary results show that uh, we do make base paths more normal without affecting our free clash coral cone well, uh, adversely. Now it's important to realize that all these restraints and validation are method independent. So they also work for cryo EM, and I think that's a nice prospect for the future. So to sum things up, uh, we now have DSSP4, which is ready for modern uh, secondary structure analysis. Uh, we showed that good collaborations are the key to better carbohydrate structures. Uh, we have the first base pair normality validation routine, and we showed that adding uh, uh, nucleic acid restraints in PDB redo improves nucleic acid structure. So to wrap this up, there's lots of people I want to acknowledge, Ida and Tim in our team who worked on the nucleic acids, Bart and Natasha who worked on the carbohydrates, Martin Heckelman who wrote uh, DSSP4, and also version three actually, and of course Tassas who is uh, the head of our team, the people at IBT for providing DNAPCO, the York team uh, who, works on, who work on Privateer, Jean Lonyu for DSSR and Garib, Paul, Bob, and Faye for RefMac, Good, the CCP4 Molimer uh, Library, and also LibG. And the funding comes from INEX Discovery, uh, CCP4, and previously also from Westlife and the Dutch government. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I hope there's room for questions. <laughs>